Hi, AP Chemistry students. We're looking at reaction mechanisms in the Chapter 12 notes. So this concept is a little funky. Just bear with me as we go through it. We normally write chemical reactions as one step, no matter how many um, reactants are involved. But what scientists find is that many chemical reactions are actually multi-step processes, meaning that the atoms collide in a certain order, and it's like a bunch of little mini reactions happening to give us our overall um, product. So we mix things together. We get these products, but along the way, as all the molecules collide, um, there are things happening that we don't necessarily reflect in our reaction. So ultimately, we call this multi-step process a reaction mechanism. So let's look at the reaction shown here. Two NO2 molecules produce two NO molecules and oxygen. This looks like a pretty simple reaction. You may look at it and think, well, these NO2 molecules just collide with each other and form the products. But what scientists find um, from data is that that's not necessarily the case. In fact, two NO2 molecules collide in this first step shown here to produce NO3 and NO. And then the NO3 breaks down into NO and O2. So each of those individual steps, the first one and the second step, individually we call those elementary steps. And each of the elementary steps, when put together, must add up to the overall reaction. So this should look like a familiar process to you. If I take these two reactions, I add them together, I've got 2NO2 plus NO3 yields NO3 plus NO plus another NO plus O2. We can see that some things cancel out. Right? The things that cancel out are the NO3 and the NO3 um, that appear on both the reactants and the products. And then 2NO, I'm left with 2NO, yields, excuse me, 2NO2 yields 2NO plus O2. That is the overall reaction, what I'm left with. These are the same two things. So our elementary steps, our proposed steps of the mechanism, have to actually add up to the overall reaction. Otherwise, it's not valid. Um, the species that get produced in an elementary step, the first elementary step and then consumed by another elementary step, those are called intermediates. So take a moment now and see if you can identify the intermediate in this reaction mechanism. Hopefully you've realized that NO3 is our intermediate because NO3 is produced in step one. It's consumed in step two. So it's not a reactant that we mixed together in the beaker. It's not a product, a final product of the reaction. It's something that forms along the way and then is immediately consumed. The steps um, are not usually observable because oftentimes they happen quickly. They are conjectured by scientists. They're based on rate laws. They're based on things that we know about molecules and reactions and a bunch of other information. So scientists kind of come up with these reaction mechanisms and then they look for evidence that their, their reaction mechanism is truthful or is valid. So let's look at the following reaction mechanism. CO excuse me, the following reaction, CO plus NO2 yields CO2 plus NO. And then we're given a rate law for it. How did scientists determine the rate law when they say that the rate is dependent upon NO2? How did they come up with this? How do they know that it's not dependent upon CO? And it's um, second order with respect to NO2. So what they do is run the reaction with varying amounts of CO and NO2 they measure which one causes an increase or a change in the rate. And they can see that changing the amount of NO2 changed the rate, changing the amount of CO did not change the rate. However, once they found that out, they believe, don't believe it happens in one step, aka CO does not collide with one NO2 to just immediately make those products. Um, and that's based on a lot of things that scientists know about the bond strengths, the thermodynamic data about these molecules. Um, if it were only one step, we would expect the rate to depend on <coughs> both reactants. Right? However, um, it doesn't. That's what scientists find is that the rate really only depends on NO2. So the experimentally determined rate law, the one that we see up here, suggests that the nitrous oxide collisions, excuse me, NO2 collisions, must be affecting the rate. 
So this leads scientists to propose this mechanism. Two NO2 molecules collide with each other. They create some products, and this happens really slowly. Those products then collide with CO and produce the over, um, some more products, and that one happens quickly. So we can see if we were to add these two reactions together, let's see if it's a valid rate law. We've got one NO, two would cancel out with one NO2. The NO3s would cancel. It looks like nothing else would cancel, so I'd be left with NO2 plus CO yields the products. And you can see that as I add these together, it looks like the overall reaction that was written up here. So this must be a valid mechanism. So what you saw on this page is that one of the steps was, or in this example of the notes, one of the steps was slow and one of the steps was fast. Right? So the slow step is what we call the rate determining step. The slow elementary step in mechanism, and I don't think there should be any blank here. Um, it's usually slow for the reason that the whatever that reaction is, that elementary step, has a high activation energy. And remember, we can um, abbreviate activation energy with EA. Therefore, it determines the overall rate for the reaction. Excuse me, determines the rate for the overall reaction. <laughs> so let's think about a funnel analogy. So I'm going to draw a funnel on my paper, and it is not very good. Here's my funnel. And then I'm going to draw a beaker below the funnel. So if you haven't seen any other rate law analogies, hopefully this will give you an idea. Um, there's one that, that you may see in class with stuffing envelopes that I think illustrates the idea of a slow step and a rate determining step and an overall um, mechanism. But here's one, one for you. So we are dripping water, we're pouring water through our funnel. So here's my drips of water. The water's coming out down here. Okay, so I can pour really quickly, right, through the top of the funnel. I can really load the water in up here. Does that mean that the water is going to get down to my beaker quickly? No, it's not. We know that the water is only going to flow as fast as it can through the narrowest part of the funnel. So water's only going to fill the beaker at a rate determined by the mouth of the funnel down here, the, the, the narrowest point. Right? So you can think about this as an overall reaction. Overall, I'm pouring water into the funnel, letting it go down into the beaker. But really, it's happening as a two-step process. The first step is the rate at which I'm pouring up here. The second step is making it through the narrow part of the funnel. This second step is the rate determining step because it's going to limit the overall rate of the reaction. It doesn't matter how fast I pour the water, how much I fill the funnel up, it's all going to be limited by the rate at which the water can get through the funnel. Same kind of thing happening with our reactions. If we look back here, um, this first step, according to scientists, is happening really slowly. So it doesn't matter how fast this second one happens. The first step of two NO2 molecules hitting each other is happening so slowly that it's going to determine the rate at which the overall reaction happens. That's why our rate law is dependent upon NO2 to the second order. Okay, so elementary steps are characterized by their molecularity, and this is getting a little bit um, in-depth. You can read some things. Wikipedia actually has a pretty good page about molecularity if you want to read about it. Um, it's not super well discussed in our textbook, so try to find some other outside sources if you're struggling with this idea. Um, molecularity is the number of reactant particles involved in each step. So can we determine the rate expression of a reaction just by looking at the overall equation? No. We don't know what the rate law is going to be or the rate law expression is going to be just by looking at the overall equation. It really depends on which step is slow and which step is fast. 
but we can deduce the rate expression of elementary steps because that's happening at a particle level. The elementary steps are actually telling us which particles collide to hit each other. So let's look at an example. If we had an elementary step where A, reactant A, just bounces off the walls of the container and breaks up into some products, this would be, um, rate expression would be K times the concentration of A. It would only depend on A. And we call that unimolecular. However, if an elementary step is dependent upon A and B hitting each other to form some products. That's dependent upon two things. We would call that bimolecular. Because A and B, this is an elementary step, we're looking at particles here, A and B have to hit each other, our rate would be dependent upon both the concentration of A and B. If we had A and A hitting each other, that would still be bimolecular. It's dependent upon two molecules hitting each other. Our rate would be K, for this step only, would be K times the concentration of A times the concentration of A, same thing as A to the second order. Okay, and then rarely if we have three molecules hitting each other in one step, that's super, super rare. Um, because think about how many ways molecules can hit each other. We've already talked about proper orientation. The, the chances of getting three molecules hitting each other with the appropriate orientation and energy is just super rare. But this is called termolecular. The rate for that elementary step would be K A times A times concentration of A or A to the third order. Okay. Now, if one of these steps is the slow step as determined by the empirical data, by experimentation, the rate law for the overall reaction would be the rate expression for that slow step. The slow step determines the overall reaction order, or the overall reaction rate. So a valid reaction mechanism must add up to the overall reaction. It must agree with the experimentally determined rate law. So that means that the slow steps rate must match the overall rate law. So we just talked about how you can write the reaction mechanism, the reaction rate laws, excuse me, for each of our steps. The slow step in our mechanism should be the overall rate law. So rare exceptions, um, catalysts and intermediates. Catalysts are <clears throat> not always shown in the mechanism or the overall reaction, but they can appear in the rate law because they influence the rate. Those are super, um, you'll rarely see that. And then intermediates are generally not in the reaction or not part of reaction. They're not observable, so they can't appear as observable. So they cannot appear as part of the overall rate law. I'll show you one exception to that in exercise 10. Okay, so there's exercise eight and exercise nine. Try working these out on your own and pausing the video as you work. When you're ready to see the answers and the explanations, unpause the video. Okay, so here's the answers. The molecularity of each of these two steps is bimolecular because two molecules have to hit each other. Step one is rate determining because it says it's slow. Um, you could also say that it is rate determining because if we write the rate law, which is part C for step one, K times the concentration of NO2 times the concentration of F2, that matches up with this experimentally determined rate law, which scientists would have determined in a different experiment. So because those two match, then the mechanism supports the rate law. And then does the elementary steps add up to the overall reaction? Yes, they do. We could see that by adding them together, canceling things out, we should get our overall reaction. Okay, second one, identify the reaction intermediates. The intermediate is NO3. That's because it's produced here in the first elementary step. It's consumed in the second elementary step as a reactant. It's not something that we would have added to the beaker if we were doing the overall reaction in an experiment. It's not a product that was formed in our beaker if we're actually doing this experiment in a lab. And then the rate determining step is step one. That's because, it doesn't tell us it's a slow step, but if we wrote the rate law for step one, it would be K times the concentration of NO2 to the second order. That matches the experimentally determined rate law. That means that the rate must depend on the speed at which those two NO2 molecules are hitting each other, aka that's what's happening in step one. Okay, so that's where we'll end um, for this video.